right, so my name is Jordan Osterhoff with Jordan Law. It can be found at www.jordanlawfl.com. Uh, you can actually find this on our website. It's www.jordanlawfl.com slash Florida Evidence Objections and Responses. So this whole entire slideshow will be available online. Um, you've also got our phone number down there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a little bit of information about how to object, and then we'll go through the rule numbers uh, as well as the objections from them and some tips and tricks. I did it pretty much in level of importance. So we'll get to a point where it's ones that are not that important. We're here for two hours. I don't know how far we're gonna get, we'll find out. So with that, any questions? All right, so the first thing is the general rules when it comes to objecting. The biggest thing is your confidence. I don't know that this will surprise anybody or not, but there will be times where you will know evidence a lot better than opposing counsel and a lot better than the judge that you're in front of. So you being confident is a huge key when it comes to that, that standpoint. So you're gonna stand up and make a legal objection. Objection, relevance. Objection, hearsay. Objection, improper character evidence. Or objection, relevance, and hearsay. And that's it. When you're making your objection, you're not going to do a speaking objection. You're not gonna argue or explain it. Sometimes the judge will rule in your favor. Sometimes they'll rule against you. Most of the time, they'll ask for you to elaborate if they're not sure, or the other side's gonna give their, uh, their response and will come back to you. So far, so good. So no, please no speaking objections. Objection, Your Honor, uh, this is harmful to my case, and I don't want this, and you're gonna hear this. Like That's not a legal objection. You're not gonna create a good appellate record. You're not gonna be able to appeal. Uh, and in theory, judges that know evidence are gonna think lower of you because you're not objecting the correct way. So one of the things that you can use to portray that confidence, if you are 100% certain, you can use the rule number. Objection, Your Honor, under Florida Rule of Evidence 90.401 or 402, this is irrelevant. You don't have to do that. There's no trick, and most of the time, everybody else is not gonna know the rule number, just please, 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 dear God, if you're gonna do that, be right about it and don't cite the wrong one. Uh, for any of you that know federal evidence better, Florida evidence is 90 point, the federal number, for 95% of the rules. So if you do a trial team case in a different state, or if you come from a different state, or if you practice a lot in federal, the rules of evidence will be very similar. Uh, we're not gonna go over the federal differences here in any great detail, this will be geared for Florida evidence. So um, again, wait for the judge to follow up. If the judge has already made a ruling, there's going to be certain circumstances where you have to put something on the record. You have to put your argument on the record for appeal in certain circumstances, not in every one. So my suggestion would be if the judge has already ruled and your honor, you know, may have you heard for the record, or can I just put this extra information on the record? I've never had a judge have a problem with that. There probably are judges who will have a problem with that, but when you go to appeal, it's better for you that you try to put more of an argument on the record. You try to help the judge do the right thing and they didn't let you. The other big thing is never, 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 ever, ever, never under any circumstances argue with opposing counsel. So I'm standing up here for objections, opposing counsel's over there. For the entirety of our objection response, I'm gonna be focused on the judge. You're a lot more persuasive when you are making eye contact with the judge. You're not gonna look at opposing counsel because one, the judge's opinion is the only thing that matters, and two, you're gonna force yourself to be a lot more professional about it when you're arguing to the judge. If you're looking at opposing counsel and engaging with them, you're gonna get a lot nitpickier, you're gonna get a lot more aggravated, you're not gonna be as persuasive. So eye contact equals persuasiveness. So they're doing something in the well, they're asking the witness a question, objection, your honor, this is irrelevant. That's it. Blah, well, blah, 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 blah. Your honor, what is relevant evidence it makes material fact more or less likely, this doesn't make it that case. Because of blah, 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 blah. That's it, I'm standing here, I'm looking at the judge, that's it, super easy. Um, most of the time you're gonna stand up for objections every now and then if you're doing some family law or some less, uh, some judges that are less specific about things, they might want you to stay seated, but I like to stand up and object. It draws attention, I think you can argue better standing up, I think it makes you speak louder than if you're sitting down, etc. So good to go on the general rules. All right, so now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty if the clicker works, yes. So the way that this slideshow will be designed, pretty much you're gonna have a rule number, you're gonna have a little bit of information about it, and then we're gonna go into potential objection responses. 
the slides that are, are white like this with the red, those are usually going to be the definitions and a little bit of information, whereas when we get to the actual argument, it's going to switch to a blue slide. I try to make it consistent throughout. Can't guarantee it's 100%, but that was my goal. So the first one is relevance. In relevance, you should ask yourself for every single question, what is the relevance of this? Why am I asking this? Why is this important? In Florida, relevant evidence is evidence tending to prove or disprove a material fact. It is evidence tending to prove or disprove a material fact. A fact is material if its existence would provide the trier of fact with a basis for making some inference or chain of inferences about an issue that is necessary to a verdict. So if you're talking about a criminal law case, it's a theft case, things that make it more or less likely that that person stole from that store are gonna be relevant. If it's a family law case, you're talking about time sharing, things that make it more or less, uh, prove that this parent should have more time or disprove it, those are gonna be irrelevant things. It does not have to be a certain amount of relevance. It does not have to be very probative. It does not have to be very persuasive. It does not have to be that good. It's just any, t any tendency is what the federal rules talk about, but it's evidence that tends to prove or disprove material fact in any amount. The slightest relevance makes something admissible as a relevance objection. So if opposing counsel argues, well, judge, it's not really that important for their case. They've got X, they've got Y, they've got Z, great. That's a question of how much weight the jury or the judge should give the evidence that's not a question of its admissibility. So for the purpose of relevance, it just has to have any tendency to prove or disprove. So far, so good. Um, if it's conditionally relevant, then it has to be, you have to be able to prove the conditioned fact by a preponderance of the evidence. What we're talking about now is gonna be like evidence 301. This is not like evidence 101 issues. If something is only relevant, if you can prove another fact, the judge has to find at that time that that other fact can be proven by a preponderance of the evidence. If the objection is made, that's the only time where you have a higher standard, where it's not just the any tendency or the lowest bar. Um, the situations where that comes up, like if somebody, if something is only illegal because somebody is a convicted felon, you have to be able to prove that they're a convicted felon by a preponderance of the evidence to get into the evidence that shows that they were in possession of the firearm or something along those lines. A lot of times it'll deal with prior convictions. You'll have the convictions. It's gonna make it way more simple than that. Uh, but I say that just so, don't try and argue that things are conditionally relevant in your favor. If you're arguing against opposing counsel and they're conditionally relevant, then it's gonna be a higher standard, okay? I don't think you'll ever come across that. Literally having done about 50 trials, I have never, ever, ever in real court actually had to argue something was conditionally relevant, ever, but it's there, so I put it in here. So far, so good. All right, so again, objection, relevance. You can see on the left-hand side, we've got the objection name. On the right, we've got different responses. You do not have to do all of these. These are not the only ones. This is not an exhaustive list, but your honor, material fact that issue is blank. This goes to make that more probable. This goes to make it less probable. A material fact that issue is who should end up having primary care of this child. A material fact is, was this item stolen? A material fact is, was this person injured in this car accident? This goes to make it more likely, this goes to make it less likely. Usually for that blank part, you're normally gonna wanna go to jury instructions or statutes that talk about things the judge, the judge should consider, but you don't have to. It can be anything that is a material fact, anything that is important enough to potentially sway a jury or a judge to rule in your favor based upon that fact being true or not can be a material fact. Relevant evidence is anything that goes to make those material facts more or less likely. So some of the other things that we see a lot of is, you know, this goes to the witness's bias and motive. You know, it's relevant because it's going to, it's going to make you think less of this witness's testimony, which that's totally fine. That makes it admissible, even if the judge is gonna think very low of it. Uh, it's just background information. So when, really, when somebody gets up there, they talk about their job, they talk about their kids, Unless that's a, an issue, really it's background information, and a judge will allow you some sort of leeway on background information. And then down here, really it's only when the judge asks why, that's when you're gonna explain how this fact makes it more or less probable. So my client being a two-time convicted domestic violencer in the past makes it more likely he probably shouldn't have his kid. 
but I'm not going to come out and say that unless you know we have to get into it to why that makes it more or less probable. Well, in theory, somebody that's committed a crime that involves violence is going to make it less likely that they should be the person who should be spending time with the child for more often, etc. And that can be for anything. All right. So relevance is the probably easiest one, but it's also the most important one, which is why I did it first. So far, so good. You should know why all of your evidence is relevant before you go into it. Do you have a question or? No. No, okay. So now, um, the way that the rules work is the O1s are definitions, the O2s are usually whether they're admissible or not. So 90.402 says relevant evidence is admissible, irrelevant evidence is not admissible, and then you get into the more specific ones. So the biggest one for relevance in the 400s is going to be 403. So relevant evidence is inadmissible if its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice or confusion of the issues or misleading the jury or needless presentation of cumulative evidence. Here, we are arguing how helpful something is. So the weight not admissibility our thing that we talked about for relevance does not apply to 403 because here we're taking the probative value, we're taking the danger of unfair prejudice, and we're balancing them. All evidence should be prejudicial. All evidence should be prejudicial. So it's not any prejudice, it's unfair prejudice. And it's unfair prejudice that substantially outweighs the probative value. So for 403, it's not that important, but it's super hurtful. That's what we're looking for. It's not close, it's gotta be substantially outweighed. And here, we are totally going to argue shades of gray the entire time. You are going to argue why it's more probative. They are going to argue why it's more unfairly prejudicial, why the unfair prejudice substantially outweighs the probative value. This one, we are arguing shades of gray. Relevance is black or white. It is relevant or it's not. Here, it has to be very probative if it's going to be very prejudicial. So far, so good? All right. So this rule goes hand in hand with 401. Um, evidence can have some relevant value, but you have to argue that the prejudicial nature of it outweighs its relevance. So the probative value has to substanti be out substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. We are arguing weight versus admissibility in this case. So that goes to say, what is prejudice? Prejudice is present when the evidence is directed to an improper pur purpose, such as evidence that inflames the jury or appeals improperly to the juror's emotions. So usually unfair prejudice is gonna be that emotional appeal. Because if you read the Florida standard jury instructions, what you think about the parties is not supposed to matter. If you like a party or hate a party, that's not supposed to matter. It probably does because it's human nature, but it's there. So something that just goes to make the other side look <coughs> bad when that's not relevant, that's gonna be your unfair prejudice. And again, that unfair prejudice has to substantially outweigh the probative value. Um, then confusion of the issues, you're going to deal with a separate issue. So um, unfair prejudice is kind of easy to, to rationalize. It's something that's it's unfairly negative on one party. Confusion of the issues, so one of the things that was in here was drug parties at a doctor's office. Like the doctor pops all these pills outside. Probably not relevant unless they're being sued for something that happened at the party. Um, damage amounts in a liability phase case, those are potentially going to confuse the issues. You know, it doesn't matter that this person broke both their legs if we're just here to decide whether or not the other party is uh, negligent or liable. And then breath results during emotion of suppress. So usually for emotion of suppress, the, the final decision is whether or not the cops could arrest this person, which then led for them to get the breath results. So bringing the breath results now would confuse the issues. They're obviously going to come in at trial, but for the purpose of our proceedings there, they're going to confuse the issues. All right? So we're balancing that probative value against any of the unfair prejudice or confusion of the issues or misleading of the jury or the needless presentation of cumulative evidence. You may have some, some issues where it'll hit multiple ones, where it's unfairly prejudicial and it confuses the issues. Great. Argue all of them and aggregate that together to be way more, to substantially outweigh the probative value. All right? I can't tell you off the top of my head what issues you'll have that will be multiple ones, but if you can make an argument, go for it. Judge, not only is it unfairly prejudicial, but it also confuses the issues and it's misleading the jury because blah, 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 and the probative value is low because of blah, blah, blah. All 
right? This is probably the hardest one to argue effectively, but at the same time, this technically applies to every single question. There is literally every single question ever asked in court could potentially be objected to with 403. It can potentially be objected to with relevance too, but a lot of them are gonna be obvious. You know, if it's somebody saying, I saw that person shoot them, it's relevant if the, that's the issue. Here you've got to, you have the potential for a 403 argument on every piece of evidence. So if something just sits in your gut and it seems wrong, you're not sure why, 403 is a good way to go too, because as long as you can argue it well, you're never gonna look that stupid. So here I would say objection, unfairly prejudicial, or objection, this is unfairly prejudicial. Uh, you can also say objection, relevance, and it's confusing the issues. Objection is irrelevant and it misleads the jury, whatever you want along those lines. You don't have to make 401 and 403 together. You don't have to make the relevance and the unfair prejudice together. You can usually, sometimes it'll just be one, sometimes it'll be both. So the burden is on you, the objector, the one who is objecting, to show the probative value is substantially outweighed. But obviously, if you're the one who wants to get the evidence in and they object to you, then you want to explain for the judge why it's not substantially outweighed. So, Your Honor, uh, the evidence will not unfairly prejudice the party, and the probative value weighs any danger. The probative value of this evidence is very high because of blank, therefore it clearly outweighs any prejudice. Or the prejudice here is not unfair. Your Honor, you know, this isn't going to inflame the passions of the jury. This goes directly to the case at hand. This is this person driving poorly 14 other times before they got into this car accident. So far, so good. Now, things may be objectionable on other grounds, or they may only be objectionable on 403, or it could be a multitude of them. We're talking about each individual rule by itself. So obviously, the, they drove poorly in the past may be an issue for character, but we're not there yet. We're talking about the unfair prejudice. Obviously, somebody being a terrible driver is going to be helpful to your case if it's a car accident case and they were driving poorly, right? Even though it may not be admissible. So we're talking about all the rules kind of individually, but when you get into court, you're gonna to have to make sure your evidence gets in around every one of the rules, okay? All right, so I went, next important one I think is hearsay. Hearsay is by far the most complicated rule that you will consistently use. I think character evidence is more difficult than hearsay. However, you'll never use character evidence. You probably will never use character evidence you'll definitely use hearsay. You will have to get in something that somebody said. So I really wanna focus on, um, you've got the rule up here. It can be oral or written or nonverbal. So me, so um, an issue about selling drugs and somebody says, hey, what do you want for those drugs? And somebody goes like this, that can be a nonverbal assertion. I'm talking about money, it's generally accepted that this means money in some form. It doesn't have to be specifically spoken. It could be written, it could be oral, it could be nonverbal, as long as it's intended by the person as an assertion. It has to be intended by the person as an assertion. The other thing that I want to focus on is in the bottom. Hearsay is a statement other than one made by the declarant while testifying. Other than one made by the declarant while testifying. So, if I take the stand and I say that three days ago, I told somebody X. Is that hearsay? Who thinks that's hearsay by show of hands? Who, who thinks that's not hearsay by show of hands? Why not? Because I'm the one testifying? Right? Is that what you think? Okay. In the nicest way possible, you are 100% wrong. This does not say declarant who is testifying. This says declarant while testifying. So if I take the stand and I say that three days ago I said X, it is still hearsay, even though I'm the one who said it, even though I'm the witness on the stand, even though I can be cross-examined, it is still hearsay. Are you going to get judges that don't understand that? Probably. Are you gonna get judges that will let that statement come in regardless of objections because you can cross-examine the witness? Absolutely. And in those situations, if it completely ruins your case, here's what you have to do. That's all you got, okay? So, um, this is the second part of 801. In the Federal Rules of Evidence, there's a whole nother section at this part 
that's an exemption from hearsay. In Florida, we don't have hearsay exemptions. We just have extra exceptions. Uh, prior consistent statements, prior inconsistent statements. The biggest one here is C, one of identification of a person made after perceiving the person. So when the cops have somebody do a show up or they have them do a lineup and that person says, I told the cop on that day that I was 90% sure the person in picture three was the defendant, this makes that admissible. It is one of identification of a person made after perceiving the person. However, that 90.801 subsection 2 subsection C only protects the person who made the identification. So a cop saying that somebody told me that this was the defendant, not covered by that section. The person who made the identification testifying in court that they made the identification is covered by this section. All right? The follow-up question being then how do you get in the cop saying the person said it? I really have no idea. It happens quite frequently, but I don't think there's actually a rule that governs it in every exception. Sometimes it could be an excited utterance. Sometimes it could be a present sense impression. We'll talk about those as we go along, but this is the one that governs it all the time, but by the person who made it. So here is, if you take nothing else from this presentation, I want you to remember the following statement. Hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered into evidence for the truth of the matter asserted. It's an out-of-court statement offered into evidence for the truth of the matter asserted. The out-of-court statement part helps because if I'm testifying that I said it, but that I said it out of court, guess what? It's an out-of-court statement. Offered into evidence, that one should be really obvious because if it's not being presented in court, it's not being offered into evidence. So what you're gonna spend hours and hours and hours arguing about is what is the truth of the matter asserted? Because an out-of-court statement offered in evidence to prove anything other than the truth of the matter asserted is not hearsay. An out-of-court statement offered into evidence to prove anything other than the truth of the matter asserted is not hearsay. It may be inadmissible under a completely different rule, but it's not hearsay. So some things that are not hearsay also, directions or commands, go to the store, close that door, etc. Those are not hearsay because there's no way for you to, those to be intended as true. There's no way for them to be intended as an assertion by you because you're telling somebody else to do something. You're not asserting that something is true. You're telling them to do it. Um, if you're using a statement to show future action, you're usually using it for the effect it had on the listener. So I'm gonna blame you if you don't climb up the tree. After that, I then climbed up the tree. I'm not really offering the I'll blame you if you don't climb up the tree part. I'm showing the future action. We're also gonna talk about 90.803 subsection three, then existing state of mind. That's gonna cover a lot of future action stuff also, but something to keep in mind here. So this is the best example that I've ever seen before. I did not come up with this. I guess I put in the Orlando part. Um, it is raining, so I get up on the stand, I say three days ago, I said it is raining in Orlando right now. Is that hearsay or is that not hearsay? I get up on the stand and I say, hey, three days ago, I said it is raining in Orlando right now. Is that hearsay or is it not hearsay? Who thinks it's hearsay? Who thinks it's not hearsay? All right, in this circumstance, everybody's correct. I did not give you enough information for you to decide. Why? Because it's hearsay if we're offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. If I need to prove that it was raining in Orlando three days ago, bingo, it's hearsay. But if I need to prove that I was in Orlando, Let's say somebody got murdered within 10 minutes of that, and my claim is I wasn't in Orlando, but somebody heard me say it's raining in Orlando right now three days ago, and they saw me outside. I'm not really offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. If I need to prove that it's raining in Orlando, then maybe it's hearsay, but if I'm using it to show that this person was in Orlando, could see in Orlando, that, we, that this person could see anything, uh, that we knew what rain looked like, that it was or not, was not raining was something that we could determine, it's not hearsay. I know that last one sounds a little crazy, but I, I just want to frame it that way because anything that is different than the truth of the matter asserted, you can offer the evidence for. Anything. All right? So, this one, hearsay is a little bit different from an obje objection standpoint because most of the time the question that's going to get asked is, hey, what did you tell so-and-so? Or what did you hear so-and-so say? Objection, the question calls for hearsay. 
Technically, no hearsay has come out, but the question is going to call for it. What did they say? What did you hear? Or objection hearsay, either one. So for hearsay, you've got a couple different ways to respond. Option one, it's not hearsay because it does not meet the definition. Usually, you're not offering it for its truth. Sometimes it will be not an out-of-court statement. Sometimes you'll be offering it not for its truth. Or you are, it is hearsay, you are offering it for its truth. However, it meets an exception. So, Your Honor, yes, this is hearsay. However, it's admissible hearsay under rule blah, blah, blah. We're going to get to some of the rules. I'm not going to cover all of them. We'll get to some of them. We so far so good? So the big thing for hearsay is, is it hearsay? And if it is hearsay, is it admissible hearsay? And I would go so far as to tell you that if you ask questions the right way, 90% of what people say is either not hearsay or it's admissible hearsay. Um, so this is the one I want to talk about first. I'm going out of chronological order. 90.803, subsection 18. These are admissions. So party, so we have plaintiff and defendant. Plaintiff can get into evidence anything that defendant said. Defendant can get into evidence anything that plaintiff said. It's just, we're going to allow it in. It's a, a statement by opposing party. What happens if plaintiff says that plaintiff never said that, but defendant has a witness that says that plaintiff said that? Does it come in? Does it not come in? Who thinks it does not come in? So plaintiff's going to say, I never said I'm going to effing kill you three days ago, but defense has a witness that heard the plaintiff say that. Does it come in? Who thinks it does? Who thinks it doesn't? Okay. I think it does come in. Even if you're going to say it didn't happen. I think you guys are right on this one. You can take the stand and deny it happened. You can present evidence to, to rebut it. You can present evidence that you're mute and can't speak and can't scream. Whatever it is. But I still think it comes in. Technically, the judge is going to have to find that it meets that exception by a preponderance of the evidence. But I think in this case, I didn't say it, is not going to really refute the preponderance of the evidence thing. Uh, you can also get in adoptive admissions. The best one, usually you see these in criminal cases. So cops come up. They find drugs in a car. There's four people in the car. They say, hey, whose drugs are these? Three people say they're not mine. The fourth person just covers their eyes and looks away. The court's probably going to let that in as an adoptive admission because in that circumstance, a normal person, if they didn't agree with the question, would have objected basically, would have said no, would have given some sort of response, and by remaining silent, they are adopting it. Not going to work in every case, but it's possible. Um, C and D I'm not going to talk about. They're going to come in very specific circumstances. You'll have to look those up as you get it. D is, uh, C is basically you're allowing somebody to, test, to talk on your behalf, like a PR rep or something. D is going to be an agency theory. We're not going to get into it too much. Um, and then I'm just going to touch on E very briefly. Co-conspirators in furtherance of the conspiracy, that's going to come in pretty much only in a criminal case. Three people get together. They decide they're going to rob a bank. This person's going to get the car. This person's going to get the guns. This one's going to kidnap the bank manager. <coughs> Anything that anybody says to further that plan is going to come in against any of those people. It's statements of co-conspirator in furtherance of a conspiracy. The biggest problem with subsection E is you have to prove the conspiracy really without the statements to be able to get the statements in, but that's going to be hyper-technical. You'll have to research that issue. So, yeah, question? What's a conspiracy go for? That's not correct. It is in the furtherance of the conspiracy. So technically, yes. However, most charges are going to give you <coughs> trying to escape will be a continuation of the conspiracy. Trying to hide evidence will be the continuation of the conspiracy. But yes, ultimately, it's in furtherance of the conspiracy. All right? Um, when you're plaintiff's counsel, you can get in anything the defendant says. You can't get anything your own client says. It has to be the opposing party. Uh, it's an admission by a party opponent. The other thing I want to touch on briefly, this is not going to include cops and victims in criminal cases. The cop is not the opposing party of the defendant. The victim is not the opposing party of the defendant. Technically, the state of Florida is, and you could probably argue that to some judges, but the best case scenario, don't plan on cops, the defense being able to bring in anything the cop says because it's a mission by a party opponent. I don't think it is. So far, so good. All right. 
So now we're getting back to the beginning of 803. Again, I went out of chronological order to go kind of in order of importance. Uh, one and two are very similar. One is spontaneous statements, two is exciting utterances. So if you go to 90.803, there's gonna be, I think 22 or 24 different exceptions. We're gonna talk about like six of them. I've never used the other 18, or I've never used about 16 of the other 18. One and two are very similar. One's a spontaneous statement, so it describes or explains an event or condition made while the declarant was perceiving the event or condition or immediately thereafter. Does anybody know how long we're talking about with the words immediately thereafter? Yeah. Is it a discretion target? Bingo. So the, the answer is I have no idea, nor does case law, nor does anybody. That is a fact specific thing. And if you really go in depth with the case law, you will find cases that talk about that 10 minutes is too much time, but that 30 minutes is not too much time. The case law does not make sense. I can't even give you some sort of guideline to 10 or 15 minutes, but you have to argue that it is immediately thereafter. All right? You are describing the event or condition made while observing it or immediately thereafter. We'll get to some examples. Now, the other one is excited utterance. Now it's a statement or excited utterance relating to a startling event or condition made while the declarant was under the stress of excitement caused by the event or condition. While they're under the stress of excitement caused by the event or condition. So here we're trading the immediacy for the fact that this person has to be startled. They have to be excited. They have to be under the emotional impact. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So the entire concept of hearsay is based really upon unreliability. The case law now talks about the ability to cross-examine, which we won't really get to, but at its core from common law, it is based upon whether or not statements are reliable. So if I'm looking out the window and saying, hey, oh my God, that car's going so fast, it just hit that pedestrian, I don't have enough time to make up a lie. I mean, I probably do, but a normal person doesn't. <laughs> or let's say that person that got hit is my kid. Actually, let me not make that joke, I have a kid now somebody I care deeply about, I'm gonna be messed up for a much longer period of time than them just narrowly missing, hitting somebody I don't know. So now, maybe I've got 30 minutes or an hour to freak out about this because I'm gonna be so emotionally racked that in theory I can't come up with a really good lie. Does that make sense? All right. So, I, this is too small for me, my eyes are done. So, must describe the event for 803 subsection one. Observing the car accident. This car was swerving right before he hit the curb. As opposed to two, it only needs to be related to the event that would be startling. So he just finished a beer before he got in the car. Oh my God, I can't believe it. So for 803 subsection two, for the excited utterance, we're gonna trade some time for the need for excitement, for the need for that emotional impact. Uh, it can be longer between the event and the statement than in the spontaneous statements. And again, I can't tell you what time frame you're still looking for. That's up to you to argue. So spontaneous statement, we're looking for something very quick. We don't care how impactful it is. For excited utterance, we can give a little bit more time, but we need that emotional impact. So when you're trying to lay foundation for an excited utterance, you need to get out how this person looked, how they appeared, how they sounded. They were emotional. They were crying. They were having trouble catching their breath. They were flushed in the face. They had just seen X happen. And then, 20 minutes later, they were finally able to compose themselves, and they said, John did it. John's the one who killed those two people. We're going to give them a lot more leeway because we can get out all of that stuff, that they're still under the impact, under the emotional effect of this. So if you think about it that way, I think it kind of makes sense. We give a little bit more leeway if it's emotionally impactful, a little bit less if it has to be right now. So far, so good? So to qualify as an excited utterance, the foundation must be laid, startling event, made before there was time to misrepresent the events, while the person under the stress must relate to the event or condition that caused excitement. So if the most ridiculous, awful, terrible thing happens to your witness, but they don't give the statement until two days later, probably not gonna work. Till a day later, probably not gonna work. They have to still be under the impact. If your witness takes a stand and testifies, hey look, I was grieving for a whole week from this, Maybe a judge will let it in, maybe you can argue it, but just know the longer time you have, the more of an uphill battle. The biggest thing being uh, that it caused a nervous excitement that they're still under the effects of it.
okay? There's probably going to be some interesting stuff that you'll find about people with like PTSD where they'll react to a prior incident and it'll cause effects later that can probably allow for a little bit wider uh, or a little bit longer term use of an excited utterance. Again, it's for you to argue. I mean, this one we're arguing shades of gray. Were they excited? Was this important enough for it to excite them this way? Can we get the statement out? So objection hearsay. Uh, Your Honor, the statement falls under an exception as it's an excited utterance. It was made following a startling event while the declarant was under the stress. It's a spontaneous statement. It's about a car accident and it talks about him observing the car accident. So far so good? All right. This one in theory is my favorite rule because it covers almost anything. It is the then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. So before we talked about future action not being hearsay, this says future action can be admissible hearsay. You can intend to do something. You can plan to do something. It can be your goal to do something going forward. And this lets it in because it's your then existing mental condition to do this in the future. So it is what it is. Um, the biggest thing is going to be on the next page. So 803 subsection three does not cover past facts remembered. What does that mean? This is the best example. Um, this literally happened in a real case. So there's a letter written and the letter says, at whatever date, please meet me at the location where we committed this murder. Flat out. Don't ask me why anybody was dumb enough to write that in the letter and send it to somebody, but they did. And then it became a case because they murdered somebody. In that situation though, the rule says that past back doesn't come in. So tomorrow meet me at the rock, great, no problem. That the rock is where we murdered John, that part's not gonna come in, it's past facts remembered. I think in that case they did end up allowing the murder party in under some crazy rule, but technically what this rule says is you can't get the past facts remembered. So in the future, meet me something based upon something we did in the past, the past part is not gonna come in, the future part will come in. All right, it could be mental states, it could be emotional states, it could be how you feel at that time, it's then existing. So when I talk about it being future action, it's at this time, it is my future plan to do X, it comes in. It's not just at that time, I had the plan to do this in the future. So at this time, I feel this way, I want to do this, etc. So far so good? All right. So objection to the question calls for hearsay. It is hearsay, Your Honor, it's a statement about future action and intent, therefore it's my then existing mental state to do it. Uh, it's admissible under the state of mind except, exception. The declarant state of mind is an issue. All right? A lot of times, things will be admissible under multiple different things, under multiple different exceptions to hearsay. You're gonna pick the best ones. You can throw all of them at the wall, you can go in order, that's up to you. I usually like if, if I have a lot that are good to pick like two, maybe three. Your Honor, it's admissible as this, or it's admissible as this, or it's admissible as not, as, a, as not hearsay, so therefore it's not offered for its truth. When you can get something in for its truth, you should. If you have an exception, you should do that first and then fall back on it's not hearsay, we're not offering it for its truth. Which is why I like 8033, because basically it lets you get in for its truth a lot of statements that would be admissible as not hearsay, but when they're in for their truth, you can argue them that they are in fact true. You can argue with jury they are in fact true as opposed to, yes, so-and-so said this, which proves that they can speak, which proves that something other than the truth of the statement. All right, any questions? So 803 subsection six, this is record of regularly conducted activity. If you call this rule the business record exception, you are wrong. It does not have to be a business record. It has to be a record of regularly conducted activity. It means there are four things that you have to show. That the record was made at or near the time of the event recorded. At or near the time. So we've talked about then existing state of mind. We've talked about excited utterances. We've talked about spontaneous statements. Time matters when it comes to a lot of the hearsay stuff. The record was made with information from a person with knowledge who had a duty to furnish such information. So it doesn't have to be a custodian. It could be an otherwise qualified individual. It's somebody who has a duty to furnish the information who knows enough about it. That the record was kept in the course of a regularly conducted 
this as business activity, really it's just activity, and that it was the regular practice of the business or organization or entity to make such record. So what does that mean? It means the person who's testifying to the business record doesn't have to be the custodian. However, it means that stores can't enter their internal slip and fall investigation. It's not Walmart's job to investigate a slip and fall. It's not Publix's job as a business to create a report of, of that person that tripped on grapes. So that's not really gonna come in as under 803 subsection six. The one interesting one is what about receipts? Are receipts admissible under 803 subsection six? By a show of hands, who thinks receipts would be admissible under this section? By a show of hands, who thinks receipts would not be admissible under this section? By a show of hands, how many people didn't raise their hand for either of the two other options? At least about 30 of you, okay. Um, another one, short answer is, I don't know. Personally, I don't think receipts actually meet the requirement under this. I understand that Walmart gives you a receipt for everything you order from Walmart, but it's not really their job to print receipts. It's just a culmination of the process. Um, I think that receipts to some extent are a verbal act because you're, it's the fin finality of a contract. I'm gonna give you money for goods. Most of the time, this is what you're gonna use to get them in though. Most of the time, you're not gonna have a problem getting receipts in under this rule, but I don't know that they actually really meet the rule because I don't know that it's really their job and I don't think that the person who operates the register is really under a duty to create that information and knows enough about it to compile the receipt. I'll leave it up to you all more than that. I promise some of these hypothetical questions do have real answers, but if, if you've learned nothing yet, we're arguing shades of gray. So most of the time, it's just whoever argues it better. So objection, the document is hearsay, the receipt is hearsay, the business record, whatever it is, is hearsay. Your Honor, it falls under the exception. We've got our four foundational points, etc. Pro tip, get out those four foundational points before you offer the thing into evidence. I'm showing you this uh, market report. Do you normally create these? Yes. Is it part of your job to create these? Yes. Do you create them at a specific time? In reference to the data collected in the report, yes. Is it, the, is it your job? Is it part of the business's job to create these reports? Yes, great. I've got my exceptions. Now, I'm offering it to evidence. Or is it fair and accurately depict what was on there, change or alter any way, whatever, now we offer it in. All right, lay the foundation first. There are, so we did one, two, six, three, one, two, three, six, and 18. Um, there's a bunch more. I'm gonna skip over to 803 subsection five and then we'll come back to some of the other ones. Hearsay within hearsay. So this is, I take the stand and I say that three days ago, I told so-and-so something. I have said it to that person, that, or sorry, that so-and-so told me something. So three days ago, so-and-so told me X. We need a hearsay exception for them to tell me. We need a hearsay exception for me to tell the court because it's an out of court statement. A lot of times it'll come up on documents. So for example, you'll have uh, some sort of like, let's say it's a market report that went into stocks over a period of time frame. There'll be some hearsay within the document itself. So they interviewed CEOs who, you know, they interviewed uh, financial advisors who found out that these stocks outperformed the market by 10%. That's a statement, it's in a document, the document itself is a statement, there's multiple levels. You can, in theory, have a million levels of hearsay. We could play a game of telephone right now, and then have, to, have the last person have to testify to what was said, and assuming what they said is what started on our chain and that it was relevant, whatever, we can get it in as long as we have an exception for every time that statement gets passed, for every declarant. Other problem. Uh, you cannot offer the statement for its truth if you can't have a hearsay excep exception for everyone. If at some point we have to offer it for not its truth for another purpose in our chain, then we really can't offer it for its truth at the end. So if it's an opposing party statement the entire time, doesn't matter how many people heard it, we're totally fine. But if so-and-so is only telling so-and-so for the relevant purpose of that they can speak, that they knew each other, that they were together, 
and then it becomes a party statement, I can't really offer for its truth because I can't get the truth the whole way in the chain. Does that make sense? That's again, that's another like evidence 301 type thing. I've never used an argument in real court. It's never come up in real court, but it's there and it's something for you to be aware of. All right, so we did not cover most of the other exceptions. You're probably not gonna use them, but we're gonna talk about a couple of the bullet points for the other ones. Um, so one of the big ones I get is dying declaration. This is one that comes up all the time. This is actually under 90.804. So 90.803, the declarant being available or not, does not matter. 90.804 is a two-part analysis. The first part is the, the declarant is unavailable. And then the second part is it meets one of the exceptions. So if I am not in court, I still may not be legally unavailable. Uh, but if I am legally unavailable, they can use 804 and 803s. If I'm in court, I can't be under 804. Uh, dying declaration though is interesting because you have to believe that you're going to die. You don't have to actually die. As long as I believe I'm dying and I am legally unavailable, which could happen because I'm dead, but doesn't have to, then you can get a dying declaration out. So I don't have to actually die. But at the same time, I have to believe I'm about to die. If I got shot out of the blue without knowing I was about to die, you're not going to get a dying declaration. It'd have to be afterward as I'm bleeding out or whatever it is. This is getting a little too morbid for me. Uh, police reports, public records in the state of Florida. They are public records in the state of Florida. However, they're not coming in in criminal cases against the defendant solely because that's in the rule. Solely because we've decided we don't want to allow that. Otherwise, they would be able to come in. And then the other one that I see a lot that people use incorrectly is 90.803 subsection 4. Statements made for the purpose of medical treatment or diagnosis. It is the statements that you make to the medical doctor, to the nurse, to whomever. It is not the results. It is not what they give back to you. It is statements made for the purpose of medical treatment or diagnosis. The belief there being, I'm not gonna go to the doctor and lie about my symptoms because I could make it a lot worse. I'm probably gonna be telling the truth, but the doctor saying you have a concussion, not gonna be covered by that rule because that's not a statement made for the purpose of medical treatment or diagnosis. That's a statement made of a medical diagnosis, okay? Technically though, if doctor goes to, or nurse goes to specialist and says, hey, uh, they've got a concussion, what do you recommend as their treatment? Now we may have an argument to get it in because they're getting the medical diagnosis for the purpose of getting treatment, but the easy way to remember it is you have to be the one who has the conditions making them to the medical person. Any questions about any of the other 803 or 804s? No. Just read through them. A lot of them are very hyper-technical. A lot of them are things in the rest of the rules. So for example, in the state of Florida, you have to testify uh, traits of character in the form of a reputation, which really would be a bunch of other people out there in the world have gotten together to come up with your reputation in this community. So it's a bunch of hearsay statements. Well, guess what? We made a specific hearsay exception that covers it, because otherwise that would never come in. It's a bunch of other people saying what they think about you for you to get their reputation together. But we have a hearsay rule that says you're okay in that situation when you're offering it for those purposes. So a lot of the other ones are very hyper-technical. All right, so now uh, we're almost at the hour mark. We're more than halfway done, which is good. Well, at least of the ones I think that we'll get to. So now we're gonna go a little bit different. We're gonna talk about opinions. So the 90.700s all deal with opinions. They deal with lay witness opinions. They deal with expert opinions. I can tell you in like 50 trials, I've had an expert witness who had their opinion challenged maybe twice. I've had a lay witness who has had their lay witness opinion testimony challenged maybe twice. It's not gonna come up that often but we're still gonna go over it, it's a pretty big one. Um, 701 deals with lay witness opinions. Basically, it has to be something that a normal person can testify to. It has to be rationally based upon their perceptions. There has to be no other way for them to testify to that fact except in the form of an opinion. So, the witness cannot readily and with equal accuracy and adequacy communicate what he or she has perceived the trier of fact without testifying in terms of interests or opinions. Clearly a lawyer wrote this, right? There's no better way than in the form of an opinion. 
I think it's warm in here. I can't really tell you that separate from an opinion. I don't know that it's, I'm gonna guess it's probably about like 78 degrees in here. I don't really know that, but for me, it is warm. That is my opinion and I can testify to that. I don't need to be an expert researcher in climate control or whatever else to do that. Uh, and then the opinion and inference do not require any special knowledge, skill, experience, or training. So what does that mean? Normally, a lay witness must testify only to facts which they observe and are not permitted to testify in form of an opinion. So normally, we're not okay with opinions, except in these very narrow circumstances. Um, oh, sorry, this should say car. So the car was going fast, an opinion, easier than the car was going 70 miles per hour. Cops will take like a four hour course where they get trained on how to detect speeds and then it's, it's uh, done by laser or radar to confirm what they're doing. I didn't take that course. I don't know if any of you guys did. So I can say cars are fast. I can't say they're going a specific speed. It has to be rationally based on their perception. A normal person can make the same opinion based on the same facts. So for example, uh, just because a witness did not observe the child draw in their room, they can give an opinion if the child was the only one in the room. If it looks like the child's drawing, if they had given a child the crayon of that color, something along those lines, those facts together are enough for me to come up with that opinion. The more facts, the better. You don't necessarily have to get all of them out, but if you have to argue it, the more facts you have, the better. Usually we're gonna testify about opinions based upon facts that we can observe with our five senses. I've never had anybody testify to anything based upon taste. It might come up, I don't know. Um, and really I've never had anybody testify based upon feel. It might come up. So really we're looking for what you can see, what you can hear, what you can observe. Um, I have actually had smell. It was an arson case, the cop testified to smelling the whatever, the accelerant. Um, but normally we're talking about five senses, what we see, what we hear, what we touch. So for example, he was screaming. Technically that's an opinion. I don't definitively know that the person was screaming, but I can observe what they're doing and based upon my life experience, decide that they were screaming or they were agitated or they were irate. It felt hot, it felt cold. Test technically that's an opinion, but based upon me having lived in, in Florida and been hot for 80% of my life up to this point, I can testify to those things. Any questions on the lay witness opinion? Okay. So, objection, improper opinion. Objection, this calls for an expert opinion. Objection, improper opinion, whatever. The opinion's admissible, it's rationally based on their perception, doesn't require expertise, whatever. You may want to go into the facts a little bit more. Look, Your Honor, uh, my client's been driving for, you know, assuming this came out of court. My client's been driving for 25 years, they've seen other vehicles drive. This one was going at a rate faster than the other vehicles. My client knew how fast they were going. They were going under the speed limit. This one was going over. They were speeding, you know, whatever. 701 is pretty easy. Um, there's a couple times where the, the biggest issue will be whether or not it requires expertise. And a lot of times you just have to rephrase it. So again, I talk about, you can't talk about the definitive speed, but that they were going fast. One of the big ones that comes up a lot is people being drunk versus being impaired or intoxicated. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that everyone in here has seen drunk people. I'm gonna assume that probably everybody in here has been drunk. Um, you can make those opinions. You can't necessarily say intoxicated. You can't necessarily say impaired. I'm gonna assume that nobody is currently drunk. <laughs> Hold on, hope. So, wait, did I? Oh, I guess I skipped 702. So uh, in a nutshell, 702 talks about you have to have the required expert testimony or experience or knowledge or training. You can be a plumber. You don't have to have a degree. You can just have done something a lot. That can be your required expertise. That can be your required experience. You can be a four-time PhD candidate. That can be your required scientific knowledge or training. Uh, it doesn't have to be schooling, it doesn't have to be on the job, it can be either one. It's going to be up to the judge to decide what's enough and what's not enough. And then you need to make sure that they testify that there are sufficient facts and data with the reliable principles and methods, that you apply the facts and data to the reliable principles and methods informing that opinion. 
If you have cases with expert witnesses, most of the time your expert witness is a horror witness whose opinion reflects evidence. But if, and I say that kind of sarcastically, but your witness usually knows what they need to testify to. They're probably not doing it for the first time. Just have a good conversation with them, usually at like $300 to $500 an hour for them. But um, you can ask them questions about, you know, what, what's your methodology? How do you come to this opinion? You know, do you, have you recorded yourself testifying before? Do you have prior depot transcripts? Whatever, most witnesses, expert witnesses will keep stuff like that. Um, and the same works in reverse. If you're gonna depose somebody else's witness, get their CV, their curriculum vitae, get whatever you can, get case numbers for prior cases, how many times they testified for this, wit for this attorney, uh, for this side, for this type of case. It'll be good, it'll be bad, but you'll have the information. All right? What about opinions on the ultimate issue? Can a witness testify to an opinion on the ultimate issue? Actually, who thinks a witness can testify to the ultimate opinion that's supposed to be decided by the jury? Who thinks you can have a witness testify to that? Show of hands. Who thinks you cannot have a witness testify to that? Show of hands. And you can have a witness testify to that. Solely because the witness testifies to raise an ultimate issue with a trier of fact does not make their testimony inadmissible. However, there's this thing that we all say called invading the province of the jury. I really have no idea where that comes from, but I've heard it a bunch, I've said it a bunch, it's worked in my favor, so I don't know. Hypothetically, in theory, there's some argument where you're balancing opinions on the ultimate issue versus invading the province of the jury. Um, the one thing you can't, opinion on the ultimate issue, you can't testify about a mental state of somebody as it relates to that being the essential element. That's a jury question. Intent, that they did it intentionally, something along those lines, you can't get into that. Um, and really, it's going to be a balancing test. It has to be a viable opinion. There has to be sufficient information for them to have the opinion. So a lot of times when somebody's going to say that somebody was definitively driving under the influence, they don't have enough evidence to give that opinion. But technically, if they do, they can give that opinion. So, uh, regarding you know, causation in a negligence case, technically this rule says your witness can testify to that. Okay? All right. Uh, 90.604, lack of personal knowledge. This is going to apply to lay witnesses. It is not going to apply to expert witnesses, which is why I do it right now. Lay witnesses can only testify to that which they have personal knowledge of. So that's why we go back to those five senses, what they see, what they heard, what they smelled, what they felt, what they observed, as it relates to opinions, but also as it relates to any testimony. A lay witness cannot testify to that which they, have, which they lack personal knowledge of. Who's heard the term speculation? Objection, speculation. Great. Who can give me a rule number for a speculation? Who can tell me where in the Florida Rules of Evidence the word speculation occurs? Exactly. It is nowhere. It is not a real thing. It does not exist. However, we all do it. Sort of like that invading the province of the jury. I don't know where it comes from, but it's here. So what is the difference between personal knowledge, lack of personal knowledge and speculation? What I'm about to tell you is Jordan Ostroff evidence. Literally, two people in the public defender's office both realized they had me as a coach on trial team because they had this conversation with each other about this difference, and that's how they realized it, because this is Jordan Ostroff evidence. <laughs> Not a real thing, but no one's ever told me I was wrong, no one's ever called me on it, whatever, so here it is. Personal knowledge. Lack of personal knowledge. That is a fact that you can know, but do not know. I do not know exactly where the temperature is outside, but I could know that. So that would be lack of personal knowledge. Speculation is something that they cannot know and does not know. I cannot know whether or not you like the weather outside because I would be speculating. Technically, you can tell me, but I don't really know whether or not you're, true, you're telling the truth. I really cannot know that. So lack of personal knowledge should be things that they can know but do not know. Speculation should be things they cannot know and do not know. The difference between somebody looks angry and somebody is angry. I can say somebody looks angry, I can't really say that somebody is angry. Am I basing my testimony on what I saw or what I heard or am I just guessing? Uh, is the answer somebody else's mental state, which you cannot really know somebody else's mental state? That's the textbook speculation. Does the witness know the answer? 
That could be a big thing. And a lot of times when they ask a question, so the witness will have to say they don't know the answer. You know, are you aware that so and so, that this is their third murder charge? Well, no, I'm not. I'm asking it because I want, I want everybody to know they don't know the answer. And if they don't know the answer, though, can the witness find the answer? Can they look it up? Is it recorded somewhere? That would be the difference between lack of personal knowledge and speculation. Uh, lack of personal knowledge, speculation, improper opinions all go hand in hand. Because again, somebody looks angry might be an improper opinion. Somebody is angry, that's going to be speculation. <clears throat> a lot of times, knowing the actual fact to give the testimony would require an expert. You know, if you went to the National Geographic Weather Center and pulled the, pulled the weather here, that would require some sort of expertise, or at least it would be hearsay. It's somebody else telling me. So you'll get into other rules. We're, again, we're keeping all the rules kind of separate here. Lack of personal knowledge versus speculation. That's my opinion as to what it is. I hope that opinion is rationally based on my perceptions. <laughs> There's no other way for me to tell you that except as it is my opinion. But again, it's never been wrong. Nobody's told me differently. I can't see anything that, that contradicts it or counteracts it, and it makes logical sense to me. I hope it does to you as well. That is not to say, if somebody objects speculation, your response should not be, well, Your Honor, Jordan Ostroff told me that this would really be a lack of pro uh, personal knowledge. You should probably just argue why they can testify to that. But when you're thinking about what to object, something to consider. So 604, objection, lack of personal knowledge. Objection, the witness does not have personal knowledge of the facts about which he or she is going to testify to. Response, Your Honor, the witness said he witnessed the event, does have personal knowledge, the witness is not speculating. They were there, they could hear this, I mean, whatever it is that you have. It's going to be kind of cut and dry on this one. Any questions? All right. So, entering evidence basics. So we've talked about the majority of the rules so far, or I shouldn't say the majority. We've talked about the rules that will cover, govern the majority of situations. This seven-step process is how you actually move stuff into evidence. Let the record reflect I'm showing opposing counsel what has been pre-marked for identification purposes as blank. In Florida, usually it's going to be a letter. Please, 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 in real court, let the clerk actually pre-mark the evidence beforehand. Make sure it's actually pre-marked beforehand. It'll make things go faster. It'll make things go better. The clerk will like you a lot more. May I approach the witness? Most people will say let the record reflect I'm showing the witness. I don't like to do that because I don't like legalese. I like normal words. So. Uh, I'm showing you what's been marked as blah, blah, blah. Do you recognize it? By me saying that, I'm showing you what's been marked, I'm putting it on the record that they're seeing it. Do you recognize what I'm showing you? What is it? Does it fairly and accurately represent the way it looked the last time you saw it? Has it been changed and altered in any way? Whatever. Whatever other foundation you need, Your Honor, we move into evidence. What's been pre-marked as usually letter to number, A to 1, B to 2, but sometimes you won't get evidence in, so you might get C might become as exhibit one, just all depends. Any questions so far? All right, we're making much better time than I expected, so we'll just keep going. So, uh, Florida Rule of Evidence 614, prior statements of witnesses. Remember, prior statements of witnesses were not hearsay if they were either contradictory or not contradictory. The big thing about Florida is you have to show them the prior statement. It's been reduced to writing. Order the statement to be shown if they object or context is closed. Um, extrinsic evidence of a prior inconsistent statement by a witness is inadmissible unless they first are afforded the opportunity to explain or deny the prior statement. The opposing party is afforded an opportunity to interrogate the witness on it or the interest of justice required otherwise. What is extrinsic evidence? Technically, it's anything that's not close enough, that is not closely enough linked to the case. What does it actually mean? I really have no idea. I don't know. If, you're, if they ask you during your depo for this case about something that's not terribly important, is that now not extrinsic evidence because it's in your depo? But if they hadn't have asked in the depo, it wouldn't be related enough, it wouldn't be extrinsic evidence? I don't know. Best practice, show them what you're gonna impeach them on. As long as you have them locked down to the right thing, it doesn't matter what they said before, what they said today is contradictory. You've got them locked in, you've got it there, you're good to go. So you can use a prior statement of a witness for two purposes, refreshing their memory or impeachment. Refreshing their memory or impeachment. Uh, 
Uh, with respect to opposing counsel, you should show them and notify them what parts of the prior statement you're referring to. It's also better for the record, you know, in their deposition on page three, line 27, or for the record, I'm reviewing the witness's deposition, page three, line 27, the light was green. Today you testified the light was red, right? Yeah, so which one is it, green or red? Because you said both. Um, the refreshing words are different than the impeaching words because what you're doing is different. The biggest difference though, other than the words, are you can refresh a witness's recollection with anything. You can refresh a witness's recollection with anything. You can literally refresh their recollection with a shoe. As long as they say that that will jog their memory, you can refresh their recollection with a smell. I have literally, in the middle of a family law hearing, I have handed my client my cell phone with my uh, case management system pulled up on it and asked them, hey, when showing you this in my case management system, refresh your recollection as to fact X. And he said yes. It was how much he pays me per hour. And it was there, and it did, totally fine. <coughs> I could not, however, impeach him with that because that's not his statement. You can refresh with anything. You have to impeach with their statement. Now, that can be as simple as so-and-so said that you said this. Did you, in fact, say it? No, I did not. That's enough. Or it can be a sworn statement or an affidavit or a deposition, whatever. If their statement is sworn, then you can get the fact in for its truth as well as for the impeachment. If the statement is sworn, you can get it in for its truth as well as the impeachment. So in deposition, they say light is red. Today, they say light is green. I have in evidence that they said the light was red. I can argue that to a jury. If it's not sworn, I can only impeach them. So same example, but it's not sworn. It's a statement they gave to the cops, not that they signed, notarized, or sworn to. Then I need to re-ask them. So today you said the light was green. In the past you said it was red, right? Yeah, so the light was red, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I just misspoke. Okay, great. Now it's an evidence for its truth. Before that last question, it was not, because it was not sworn. Make sense? All right. 90.105. Uh, so now I've gotten to the point where these are mostly, are certainly less relevant, so now we're going in chronological order rather than importance. Preliminary questions, this is what we talked about before, something to object on relevance, these preliminary questions, their initial questions, their background questions, something along those lines. Um, you can just read through the rule. I've never objected. This is an improper preliminary question. Here's one that'll come up quite a bit. 108, introduction of related writings or recorded statements. What this says basically is, if I move a piece of evidence in a writing, a recording, um, and I don't move the entire thing in, then opposing counsel can object pursuant to the pursuant to this rule. Um, they can move in other portions. The rule of completeness is what it's called. So what we're talking about is the rule of completeness. Uh, if we're reading part of a document, usually it's a statement, usually it's a deposition or a sworn statement, they can have the other parts read. So if they want to at the same time. So I want to read line three through five. They can have us then read six and seven immediately. They can also have us read lines 28, 102, whatever it is, it's this, as long as it's the same document. And what that talks about is, I mean, it, it makes sense from the standpoint of we have the opportunity to present a case in the way that we want to, but sometimes we're gonna do that in a manner that is sneaky. So sometimes we'll get witnesses, they'll do a deposition, the deposition will be 100 pages. There will be thousands of lines. At one point they said they don't remember something. At another point they said they were not sure about something. At a third point they said they think it was this way, all about the same fact. Well, I only want to read in the one that's good for me. Opposing counsel probably wants us to read in the other ones. So the jury knows that they've previously been on the fence about this. They've previously been not sure. Um, or sometimes people will, like, um, I forgot what the movie was. There's a movie with Steve Carell where he quotes the John the uh, John Lennon Imagine, they say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not. And then the other person goes, the only one, and has to explain like the rest of the line. You'll get some stuff like that, where somebody will stop something mid-sentence, and you're like, that changes the entire position of this. So we've got a uh, rule completeness there. All right, I really don't want to talk about character evidence for a number of reasons. 
but we've got enough time, so I'm going to go over it briefly. Let me start this way. You are never, ever, 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 under any circumstances in real court, ever going to use character evidence. But we're still going to talk about it, because it's there. Character evidence is found, oh, I shouldn't say this, you're never ever going to use 400 character evidence. Character evidence is in the rules twice, once under the 400s, once under the 600s. Under the 400s, it is every character trait except for truthfulness or credibility. Under the 600s, it is only the character trait of truthfulness or credibility. So when you impeach a witness with them a previous conviction for a misdemeanor involving dishonesty or for a felony, you are only impeaching them under the 600s for credibility, for truthfulness. That doesn't make them a bad person. The rules say it just makes them a liar. So 400 evidence is everything but credibility or truthfulness. 600s are only credibility and truthfulness, which is why you'll see a lot of times it'll reference, like, for a character of a witness, read through those rules, because a witness's character for truthfulness is always going to be an issue. Uh, so right off the bat, it's inadmissible to prove action conformity with on a particular occasion. Inadmissible to prove action conformity with on a particular occasion. So inadmissible to prove action in conformity therewith. It is admissible for any other purpose. It is only inadmissible if it's for action and conformity therewith. Okay? Except the accused. So a defendant can put on their character that they're a good person at forever in a criminal case. And then, the, and then only if they do that can the prosecution rebut. And same for victim. If there's a perpetrated character of the victim, the defense can bring it up, then the state can rebut it. So you're usually looking for their, uh, they're the aggressor in a self-defense type case. The character's an issue. They are known to be violent. They're known to be a bad person. They're known to be aggressive. Whatever. Still has to be relevant. Still has to be a pertinent trait of character. Still has to be at issue. Okay? This one, I guess technically you may use. So 404B talks about other crimes, wrongs, or acts. And the easiest way to explain this is to give you examples. But similar fact evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or acts is inadmissible when relevant to prove is admissible. When relevant to prove a material fact and issue, including but not limited to, including but not limited to, motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, Ab uh, absence of mistake or accident, but inadmissible when it's relevant solely to prove bad character or propensity. So if you're not offering to show propensity, you can bring in character evidence for any other purpose. What is the difference between those two things? It is the finest, smallest, thinnest hair that you have ever come across, but that thinnest, finest hair is the difference between admissible and not admissible. So it can be any reason that isn't preponderance. The one, the big one that's not in the rules that we use a lot is for knowledge. I don't need it to be true. I need them to have knowledge of that fact. A lot of times it'll come up in big civil cases. There's some study done internally by Toyota that finds out that sometimes the accelerators stick and the car jumps forward. They're aware of that. Guess what? Now they can get punitive damages. I don't care whether it's true. I'm not offering it to show that, they, that that's what happened in this case. I need to prove that they had knowledge for the purpose of damages. Anything other than propensity is fine. The easiest example is one I have here. Wear a certain mask, get caught once. 12 publics get burglarized in the same three month span. Every single time the person comes in, they're wearing a Ronald Reagan mask. On the 12th time, that person gets stopped. They get unmasked by Scooby-Doo and the gang. Come to find out it's Old Mr. Flanders, who robbed all those public for his retirement. The height matches, the weight matches, the mask matches, the way that they broke into the store matches, the fact that it was public matches, whatever. I can use the one where he's found to prove the other ones. I'm using it to show motive, I'm using it to show plan, I'm using it to show common scheme, whatever. Am I using it to show propensity? Yeah, basically. They were found in this one, they robbed this one the same way, it must be them, but the rule says, guess what, I can do it in that example. Okay? So, character may be an element of the claim, then it's at issue, 
It's not allowed to show propensity because he stole once, he probably robbed the bank, not good enough. Uh, a lot of times it's going to go with 403, it's, it's going to be unfairly prejudicial because it's bad character. Character for truthfulness is put at issue when the person testifies, and so it's always an issue. When you testify, it's always an issue. Also, when a statement that you made comes in as a hearsay exception, your character is an issue. Hughes line of criminal cases, defense attorney asks cop, hey, didn't my client say that my client didn't do it when he arrested for the DUI? Yep. All right, now I get to move in the 47 prior convictions of that defendant. Because a statement came out for hearsay from them, it puts their character at issue, so I can now attack it the same as I could if they testified under the 600s. Make sense? Please don't make that mistake. I have never made that mistake, but I've used that mistake against PDs when I was a state attorney in a former life. And the look at everybody's face when suddenly those 800 pages of JNSs are getting presented into evidence. It's good. Uh, JNS means judgment and sentence, so it's the proof that they've been convicted. Yes? Is that because the door was open to talk about what you're doing? Uh, that's because I think it's 90.807 says at the point that somebody becomes a hearsay declarant, they're, they're already treated as if they testified in, in court. Oh. So the short answer is yes, the long answer is the rule, the, the rule specifically says so. Yes? I know this is outside of the purview of back to entering this, but how would you then go about entering the JNS at that point in time? Well, okay, so technically in those circumstances, we took a break, released the jury, uh, defense counsel stipulated to a certain number of them, and then when they came back, we said, members of the jury, I know you heard a statement that the defendant denied being involved, or not denied committing the crime. You should also consider the fact that the defendant has been previously convicted of 14 felonies and seven crimes of dishonesty. If that wasn't the case, you could actually enter them. But in an abundance of caution, we did it that way. All right. Uh, I had something else I wanted to bring up here that I totally forgot about. So hold on, give me one second. Stole four of three. I don't know. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe it won't. So admissible, inadmissible character evidence. Your Honor, a good character. The witness is directly at issue. It's an element of the claim. The defense put it at issue. The door's been open. Whatever. So in civil cases, it has to be a material fact. It has to be an issue. In criminal cases, the defendant can bring it up and then the state can rebut it. Oh, that was it. So in criminal cases, the defense has to put on good character of their client first. For everybody else, the character has to be attacked first. So for a victim, I have to attack them as them being violent first, then it can be rebutted. For any civil witness, Somebody, the other party has to attack the witness's credibility or character first for it to be bolstered. The only exception is a criminal defendant. A criminal defendant has to put on good character first. And if you do criminal law from either side, you'll know exactly why. Because sometimes you have a really good case and a really good story and your client has a wonderful thing to tell, but they're a 40-time previously convicted felon. And most jurors are going to be like, well, what's one more? We don't care despite them actually being innocent, okay? So that's why they get the right to remain silent. That's why they get the right to put their good character forward first. All right, methods of proving character. Um, in federal court, you can prove character in the form of an opinion. In Florida, you cannot. It has to be in the form of a reputation. It has to be the reputation in a community. What kind of community? I don't know. If you can argue it to a judge, you can get that community. But it has to be a reputation in a community. It could be the legal community, it could be a church, it could be a school, it could be an office place, I don't know. Um, specific instances of conduct, those are specific instances of conduct. Specific things, individual events, you can show that on cross. Okay? So, uh, must be reputation in a community, so everybody in the office thinks that so-and-so is a liar. It is their reputation at the office that they are a liar, okay. There was this one time that they lied, not okay. You can use it on cross once it's already come up. Okay, the other one, um, normally this is gonna come up, so so-and-so takes the stand. Uh, the defendant's a great guy, criminal case. Great guy, would never do anything like this, super nice, always caring. Well, hey, are you aware that 
he punched his wife in the face two weeks ago? Oh, well, no, I'm not. Okay, are you aware that three years ago he got convicted of this? Oh, no, I'm not. Are you aware that six years ago he lied on his law school application? Oh, no, I'm not. Are you aware that eight years ago he got thrown out of the school for fighting somebody? Oh, no, I'm not. Because guess what? No juror in their right mind should believe that person's opinion now. They don't really know the person. They don't know any of these things. So that's why we get to use the specific instances of conduct on cross-examination to undermine that opinion. All right? All right, character of witness as impeachment. We're in 609, we're in the 600s. In the Federal Rules of Evidence, I believe this is Rule 610, one of the only ones where it switches. In Florida, it is 609. You can attack or support the credibility of a witness, including the accused, by evidence in the form of reputation, except that it must only refer to character relating to truthfulness. Truthfulness, credibility, they are synonyms. It has to be for truthfulness. It can't be that they're nice. It can't be that they're violent. It can't be that they're smart. It has to be that they are a truthful person or a liar. Uh, only admissible after the character has been attacked by reputation evidence, except for the defendant. Uh, except the truthful character of the witness is admissible, it must be in reputation. You can present truthful evidence only after it's been attacked, except for defendant. All right, a um, couple things. You can bring in prior felonies or prior convictions for misdemeanors involving dishonesty in Florida. Literally, it is, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes. How many times? Blank. Have you ever been convicted of a crime involving dishonesty? Yes. How many times? Blank. That is it. You do not get to go into the charges. You do not get to go into the results. You do not get to go into the punishments. Unless you are the one who has that history. Then go into it. My favorite defense ever in the history of me doing criminal defense work for so long, I always love it when a defendant takes a stand and says, yeah, I got a bunch of priors. Guess what? I pled to all seven of those cases because I did those, but this one I didn't do, and that's why I'm here at trial. Love it. It's fantastic. Or the other one, and I swear to you I've seen this presented. I have not had the pleasure to do so yet. Yeah, I pled to four prior felonies. They were cocaines. That's how you know I don't sell heroin. I only do cocaine. <laughs> I have heard that one. Literally verbatim like that, a defendant took the stand and said that. I was prosecuting him, he got convicted, um, but he was able to go into it, I couldn't. The other one that comes up a lot as inadmissible character is whether or not somebody's a drunk. This is the, this is the one that I would say is the toughest one to rationalize Across the other rules, like if you take the stand and say so and so is a reputation as a town drunk, that's always going to be prejudicial. It's usually going to be unfairly prejudicial, <coughs> but it may it may be okay as it relates to they don't necessarily have the best memory, they don't necessarily see things clearly. Um, you can't take their word that well. I don't know. That's that's the toughest one, uh, and I thought I had a slide on it, but I didn't. Is whether or not somebody is a drunk. Obviously, we are in a criminal case prosecuting somebody for a DUI. The fact that they're drunk, super relevant, but super unfairly prejudicial. Probably not going to get over 403, even if we, even if they put on testimony that they're a great person. Even if they put their character at issue, we're probably not going to be able to get to use the drunk one in that case, but we can try. So far, so good. All right. So now I have a bunch of other objections <coughs> that are out there. Uh, some of them are governed by the rules, some of them are not, but they're here. So ambiguous or vague questions, the question is vague. It doesn't ask for specifics, something along those lines. These ones, I don't think I've ever, I, I don't, I've never objected to vague. I don't care. If they're leading this witness in a manner where it doesn't make sense to anybody, just let them do it. The only time I would suggest doing these is you've got a jury in the room and you want to be friends with the jury. You want the jury to know you're the one who's not trying to waste their time. Then I would be like, objection, it's vague, it's, it's non-responsive, we'll go through the rest of them. But for the most part, just let other people suck. That's the advice that I would give you to a lot of these questions. Argumentative, it's argumentative, it's asked for the purpose of making an argument to the jury, it doesn't seek new evidence, just the counselor's conclusions. Okay, so you're telling this jury that you didn't call the police even after A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. Technically, that's argumentative, it's an argument you made, I literally could never object to argumentative in real court, uh, maybe during an opening statement here or there, but never else. 
asked and answered. This one I object to a lot, I gotta tell you. Uh, again, it goes back only when I'm in front of a jury, only when I wanna be the one who is not wasting the jury's time. Objection, Your Honor, this has been asked and answered three times, four times, five times. I will always give opposing counsel a second shot. If they wanna repeat the exact same question twice, great. When we get to number three, four, five, then I'm gonna jump in and have a problem with it. And again, I'm doing it, I don't really care. Half my cases are gonna be paid by the hour, I really don't care. The other half of my cases, it, you know, I've read this case, I'm through the case 100 times. I, I've heard this fact 100 times already, but I want the jury to be like, I'm not the one wasting your time. I'm trying to get us out of here. I think this is stupid too. There's ask and answer. There's a split on ask and answer. If I ask a question on direct, you ask the same question on cross, is it really ask and answer? Technically it is. Most people will allow two bites of the apple, but I ask it on direct, you ask it on cross, I try to come back and ask it on redirect. That most judges are gonna not allow. Okay? Uh, assumes facts, not in evidence. This is, I guess actually I've objected to this one because I want to, a lot of less experienced and or worse attorneys will write out questions and read the questions and a lot of times you'll win an objection on question four. So question five doesn't make sense because they said, well now that you talked about what was ever in question four and then I'm like objection, you know, that assumes facts, not in evidence. But that's gonna be a situation like, hey, after your client murdered somebody, or after you murdered that dude, where'd you go? Objection, assumes facts, not in evidence. Unless they already confessed. You'd be surprised, that happens quite a bit. Um, so your honor, you know, this fact is in evidence, it was testified to by so-and-so, it was proved by X, whatever, all right? If it's not in the question, the answer is going to put it into evidence. So what did you do next? I shot the guy puts that in evidence. After shooting the guy, what did you do? That may not be in evidence yet. That difference makes sense? Okay. Compound question. Uh, what time did you go to the store and did you see a girl stealing cookies? It's a compound question. There are two questions. The response to this is probably, I'll rephrase, just don't ask compound questions. If somebody else does, see if it matters. If they're really trying to trip your client up, you know, they want your client to say no, and one of the things your client's saying no to, or yes to the question, one of the things is them admitting something bad. All right, objection, it's a compound question. But really, you're just making a terrible record that you're not gonna be able to appeal later. Um, it's not gonna be a huge deal on the compound questions. So the ones at the end, these are all argumentative, asked and answered, assumes facts, not evidence, compound. Uh, leading questions. These are things that usually it's bad attorneying will cause these questions more so than the actual facts themselves. You can't lead a witness on direct unless they're a hostile witness. You ask permission to treat them as hostile. Leading questions, in my opinion, are questions that suggest the answer, not questions that suggest one or two answers. Old school, older people will tell you any did question is leading. Did you do this? Because the only two answers are yes or no. I don't think that's leading because it doesn't suggest an answer. It suggests one of two possible answers. However, on cross, you want to lead. You should be asking leading questions on cross. All of your questions on cross should be leading. You did this, didn't you? You did that, didn't you? Isn't it correct that you did X? That you saw Y? Whatever. So you can lead on cross, you should lead on cross. Every now and then, um, you're not gonna get the chance to do depositions on criminal misdemeanors. Something's gonna happen in your family case or your civil case you didn't plan for. Sometimes you do have to ask a question that you don't know the answer to. It's up to you whether you do or not. It's the age old adage, you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. I can tell you definitively, I have asked multiple questions in court that I didn't know the answer to. Sometimes it was asking my own client a question that I didn't know the answer to. But we had enough of a discussion, I figured that they wouldn't lose it in that moment. Sometimes it's asking a cop questions I don't know the answer to. It's just, it's the reality of it. Um, the people that tell you that, for the most part, they're gonna be you know, big, giant civil firms that have a you know, regu relatively small caseload. They can do all that stuff. Again, in a, in a misdemeanor case in criminal court, I cannot take depositions. So literally every question I ask is either in the cop's report or I don't know the answer to unless I did public records requests or whatnot. Um, 
but you can't lead on direct, you can't lead on cross. Narrative, the answer has gone far outside the bounds of the question, which is sort of the same as non-responsive, which we'll get to. Um, what did you do next? Well, you know, I got up that morning and I put on my shirt and I wasn't sure if I wanted to wear my blue shirt or my green shirt, so I did this and I decided to do that and then I had pancakes for breakfast and I was wearing my blue shirt so I don't want blueberry pancakes. We've hit a narrative. But a lot of times, again, just let it happen. Just let it go. When I told my story just now, the narrative, how many of you kind of like zoned out? Be honest. Right, that's what the jury's doing. So when you object narrative, you're like, now ask better questions opposing counsel so the jury will actually pay attention. Like, just let the witness narrate. It doesn't matter, the jurors have zoned out. Most of the time, I mean, we have an attention span like the goldfish, especially in court. Nobody wants, well, very few people want to be on a jury panel. So if they're asking two questions and the witness is giving a 45 minute response, they're gone. If you want them to go back and focus on each individual question, each individual answer, then you can object narrative. Again, I suggest you don't unless <coughs> it's, you know, you're, you're saving time for the jury. Um, Non-responsive, the question is never answered. The answer does not actually answer the question. Narrative, they answer the question and they've gone so much farther than it, so they're pretty close. That's why I would say non-responsive I'd object to sometimes, especially um, what happens a lot of times for us is I've got a prosecutor who's been doing his job for like all of two weeks. I've got a cop that's been doing his job for all of two decades. The cop knows what needs to come out, the prosecutor doesn't. So they ask a question and then the cop is going to give this whole great long explanation that actually comports the rules of evidence and does all these things. I wanna stop that. So objection non-responsive, objection vague, object whatever. Only in those circumstances um, I can't say, I can say thankfully that has not happened to me at trial, but at motions to suppress. I think there's a couple people in here that have watched me at motions that have observed what I'm talking about where the prosecutor has no idea what they're doing and the cops trying to bail them out. When I smell blood in the water, I like to go after it, especially if there's no jury. If there's a jury there, it'll be different, but man, when it's, when it's me, the judge, and some prosecutor is literally shaking and reading off of a pad, I'm going for blood, I'm great whiting him. There's just no, <laughs> it's gonna be the highlight of my day. All right, uh, I think that's it. We are never in my life have I done anything faster than I expected. I don't think so. What, any other questions? Anything you want me to go over again? I figured this would take two hours and really I thought we, there'd be more questions. Thank you, no, thank you Yeah, all right, no problem. So then it's just short thing. So if you need the slideshow, it is on our website, www.jordanlawfl.com slash Florida Evidence Objections and Responses. I think there's a hyphen between all the words. Or you can email me, jordan at jordanlawfl.com, and I'll send you the link. But it should be on our website now with the whole slideshow. The link you sent me, I couldn't get the word for it. Okay, I tried to get it to see the words. I, I, I'm just, I'm trying to get it right now for some reason. No? I mean, it takes me to your website, Yeah. and it actually shows the first slide, but I can't Enlarge it, I can't play it. What if you click on the slide? I already did that. You may have to download it. You can't download it, I can't see that. Yeah, I tried to do it too. So okay. I, don't know there's some. I will talk to my tech guy. Also, this video should be uploaded on there as well. Right in the I mean, it even comes up. So no, it looks like. Yeah, so it's there. Um, we may just have to host it.